Hi, my name's Rich Harrington, and welcome to this class where we're going to explore how to get the most from an iPhone using Apple Pro Raw and Adobe Photoshop. I'm really glad you could join me for the Photoshop Virtual Summit. This is going to be a really fun class, and I think you'll enjoy it, particularly if you love shooting on your iPhone. Now, what we've seen over the recent years is that iPhones have really been upping their game. We've seen improved lenses, better sensors, and it's made it a pretty capable camera. It just happens to fit into your pocket as well, which means you pretty much always have it. But when you add Photoshop to these images, they really can shine. In this session, I'm gonna show you how to change your iPhone settings so you can capture the highest quality images with your iPhone natively. I'll also show you how to transfer those images into Photoshop and make sure they come over in a raw format. How to remove lens distortion, as well as make sure you're getting the maximum dynamic range by using the correct color profile. And we'll talk about color mapping a bit too. I'll also show you some hidden data that can be stored inside these files. Now, you're gonna learn how to set up the iPhone for the best possible image, how to use third-party apps for more control, how to seamlessly transfer those files, and how to control lens distortion. So this should be a really fun class. It's gonna teach you a lot about Photoshop and more about your iPhone. My name's Rich Harrington, I'm a visual storyteller, and I've really been exploring the fusion of photography and video for many years. I help empower creatives also, thanks to AI, and I enjoy being a husband and a father. My background? I've written more than 40 books about photography and video, including several official books for Apple through the years, and I've released more than 200 full-length video courses. I'm a publisher. I put out the websites ThinkTapLearn as well as Photofocus.com, get a chance to speak at conferences and events, which I really enjoy, serve as a technical consultant, and also create photographs and direct professional video. I've had a chance to work on many projects through the years for a lot of high-tech companies and also nonprofit agencies. And from time to time, I get to help make software tools better and work with some pretty cool television networks. If you wanna get in touch, feel free to reach out on LinkedIn. I'm happy to connect with other professionals and those who are deeply passionate about digital imaging. Okay. Let's talk about the iPhone and its lenses. It's important to understand this so you know what you're capturing and how to make the right choices. Okay, let's talk about the lenses you'll find on your iPhone. First up is the telephoto lens. This is a 77 millimeter focal length and it's a 3X zoom for optical zooming. This is an improvement over the 2X zoom. You can go beyond this, but when you go above 3x, you're basically digitally zooming, so you're better off moving your feet. It's a pretty solid aperture at 2.8, which lets in a lot of light and is good for shallow depth of field. If we go on over to the ultra-wide lens, this is the one labeled 0.5. It's the really wide-angle lens, fast aperture of 1.8, and also has a six-element lens. My favorite lens, though, is the standard wide lens, the one lens. This is the one that works really well for macro photography on the iPhone. It also offers sensor shift optical image stabilization, and that works quite well when you're shooting handheld or need to stabilize video. With that wide angle, you're capable of getting macro photography, getting as close as two centimeters to your subject, and can really stay quite sharp. So make sure you know how to switch between those lenses. You can really see what's capable here, getting in close on your subject with that macro type photography. Some really fun options. I just love getting close details or pushing it for shallow depth of field. Okay, let's take a look at some of the settings you could tweak inside your iPhone so you're capturing the best image. There's a handful of settings you really should know about. You can start by launching the settings app. Then what you wanna do is scroll down until you get to camera. Here, there's a few categories to pay attention to. First up, go to formats, and this is where you can decide what to capture. 
I recommend, you know, when not capturing RAW, to use the high efficiency image format. It's much more space conscious, but we're mostly going to be capturing RAW. So it's important that you flip the switch here to enable Apple Pro RAW. If you don't do this, it's not going to capture. Now, what this does is it lets you get a 12-bit RAW file, which is pretty awesome. And it's a DNG file format. Each one's going to be about 25 megabytes. Go back. And the next thing to pay attention to is the preserve settings. This controls what happens when you go in and out of the camera. I like to preserve the last settings so it doesn't keep resetting back to options like the HEIC files or using the live photo setting. I also like it to preserve the creative control. I do have it reset macro here. I don't want it to keep using the same macro settings, so I let it go back automatically. I do want the exposure to stay the same. I let night mode reset because things are so varied there when shooting at night. And you can see here, pretty straightforward. Preserve the Pro Raw. And I definitely want to preserve the live photo setting so it doesn't keep automatically resetting to live photo. Live photo is good for a few circumstances like making long exposure or weird boomerang effects. But for the most part, it's a bad idea because it's a lower quality file. It's basically video and it's certainly not raw. Other things to think about, I like to use the volume up for burst. This lets you use the volume up button to shoot a high speed burst mode. And then you can decide what else you get. I like to get the composition grid to help me with overlays and to see outside the frame. So if I'm using a cropped photo with a different aspect ratio, this still lets me see more. Now, there's a newer option on iPhones called Photographic Styles, and these look like they would be cool. Stay away from them. I strongly recommend you just keep this on standard. Lens correction is a good idea. This is gonna help compensate for lens issues. And then prioritizing faster shooting will take care of if you have to do burst mode a lot. I do recommend seeing the controls from macro. This will give you better control over macro, including a one button that you can tap. Let me show you that really quick. We'll go here into camera mode and I'm gonna switch. You see the ability there to toggle between macro mode. So here we're trying to focus, we're super close, we can't do that. But if we go into macro mode, much easier to set that focus there precisely. You'll notice it's a bit slower as it auto focuses, but we have that precise control there. Again, only for the 1x wide angle lens. So don't use the ultra wide lens when you want macro. It's also available here now on the 3x lens. And you can see that that's really good for super tight shots. Look at that texture that we're actually seeing there. But again, pretty slow for autofocus. Let's get that in there and tap. And you see it's trying to autofocus there. We can get pretty close to the subject. There you go. Let's review what those camera settings now actually do. First up, since I enabled Pro Raw, you see we can go in and out of Raw with just a tap. Additionally, this is where you go into Live Photo. You can't shoot raw and live photo at the same time, so make sure you check that box there. And remember, by using the preserved settings option, it's not gonna lose its place, so it'll hold on to that. Now, this setting over here is gonna bring up the exposure compensation, and that's also right there with the plus and minus. This lets you override exposure in this case, for example, I can underexpose a bit to darken that background. And you see the change that it brings about. This mode here is night mode. And you can draw that out, and it's going to increase the long exposure. Depending upon the amount of light you have available, it could let in more light. Let me go ahead and temporarily turn off some light 
the little lower scene. And it lets in more light into the shot. There's the end results. So pretty solid. Bring the light back on. Now, as you look at your overall settings, keep in mind, you can also change the crop. And this is adjusting. That view outside the frame option. option there, that shows you more of the shot that's outside of the usable area. So when we capture, it's only capturing that, but we can see the additional area, which can help with composition for a moving subject. Let's go back to the square crop there, and I'll go to the 1x lens. All right. A newer option that you see here too is the ability to scan the text. So it's actually highlighting text there in the camera, as you see, and that gives you the ability to copy text or look up. That's not really tied to raw photography, but that is interesting as an option there for loading in data. That's a newer update on the iPhones. A lot of people miss that one. Beyond that, you can control what happens with the flash there with a simple tap. I usually like that down. And remember, tapping that triangle button exposes the advanced controls. This is where, for example, you could take advantage of the self timer, which can be useful to help stabilize the shot, especially if you're using a smaller tripod. All right, those are some of the key settings that you should know about. I strongly recommend using Apple Photos to get your images off your iPhone. If you're using iCloud Photo Library, they'll sync by default. Now, you might think it's as simple as drag and drop, but that's not the case. When you do that, it just opens up as a JPEG, which is not what you want. So you really need to transfer this data, and I'll show you how. Back here inside of Apple Photos, what you wanna do is choose to export that. So File, Export, and this one's important, unmodified original photos. Now you can select more than one at a time, which is great. Choose to export that. I suggest you include the camera information as XMP metadata, so Photoshop and other apps can read it. Feel free to use the file name, any subfolders you want to organize, and then click export. Let's save this out here, and I'll show you what it looks like. Now, when we go into Photoshop and choose File Open, we can navigate to that folder. Inside is the DNG file now, which is a digital negative, that's an Adobe RAW file type, and some metadata and extra sidecar files here that contains information. Now, when you open that file up, you'll see that you can indeed access Adobe Camera Raw Dialog. So when we click auto and we start to work with this, it actually comes across. Notice we're working with a true raw file with great recovery detail. Now we're gonna talk more about the settings in here to note, but one that I really wanna point out is this one here, making sure you specify the correct profile. And if you go black and white, there's also an Apple Pro Raw monochrome you see a huge difference there between the Adobe standard profile and the Apple profile. Same thing here. Let's go with regular Pro Raw versus Adobe Color. And you see that all that HDR recovery is lost if you don't use the Pro Raw profile. Now, let's talk a little bit about that dynamic range. The dynamic range capabilities of the iPhone 13 are quite impressive as long as you're shooting Pro Raw. You're really going to see extra detail there in the shadows and highlights. Now, what I noticed is that I could shoot some pretty tough scenes. High contrast, nighttime photography, super bright spots, and it still holds up. But again, it's absolutely essential that you open that up with the correct profile. If you don't, you're not going to get the results you expect. On the left, you see an iPhone 11 image compared to the iPhone 13 Pro. Just look at how good it did with those contrast details. I really like the richness of the color and the black and white points. 
These are unprocessed images. You can see here on the iPhone 11 that it just kind of looks washed out and lacks depth. But with the 13 Pro, such richer shadow detail really works nicely. The key, be 100% positive that you choose Apple Pro Raw. As you see there, so much more comes out and you can even use this slider a bit to go between and refine that. Normally profiles don't have a slider unless they're stylistic, but this is quite useful to just balance that out. Then you can take advantage of the rest. I'll just do an auto recovery here and let's come down to curves and use the targeted adjustment tool. This makes it simple to click on different areas and finesse and look at how we can really recover the flowers there and play with the shadow point and even the pure darks. There we go. Just to balance that out. Really quite nice. Remember, speaking of target adjustment tools, you can also switch here to the color mixer and then use luminance. And this makes it easy to target a specific color for refinement. You see how that raw file really holds up nicely and can be blended. Now, while we're here, I'll mention one more thing and then we'll do some more files a little later. Don't forget about the optics. This is where you can apply profile corrections and you'll need to specify auto and potentially assign the camera. Sometimes it's not able to pick it up. So make sure you look at what you used. In this case, I've got the 1.8 lens here. So I know that this is an iPhone 13 and I was shooting on the Pro and we can assign the correct back camera there. There we go. And got good solid lens correction. Nice. Sometimes the auto profile will come through. Sometimes it doesn't, it's not consistent. So make sure you pay attention here to the aperture as well as the focal length. All right, very solid. Now we're gonna explore Photoshop more in depth, but I wanna take a moment to show you two additional apps that are capable of shooting raw that offer some more advanced controls than the built-in camera. One of my favorite apps is Halide. It offers some pretty awesome controls. You'll notice first up the ability to work, of course, in an automatic mode, which is very much like what you're used to. And this is just a simple tap to focus allowing it to control. Now, there's lots of on-screen controls. I really like the manual mode though. You'll notice here lots of great options. For example, we can go to a true macro type focus and then slowly adjust. This allows for super precise focus. Let's tilt down a little bit here. And notice as I start to drag, the manual focus controls. As you're doing that, you can also see focus peaking, which you could turn on and off. And those are those green overlays. See how they're on the background there versus now moving towards the foreground with our foreground subjects having green edge detail. Focus peaking is awesome so you know what's going on with your edges. It's a feature that many video cameras have and you can see there as we rack through the focus, really precise control over judging what's in focus. Now, you can also go to a regular sort of mode here, cycling between the different lenses. As you see there, we go in and out, being able to control the lenses on the camera. Additionally, you can go in and control whether or not the histogram is visible. And if you want to use that zoom lens, you can cycle between the three lenses right there on your device, which is pretty cool. Let's go a little wider here for a second. We'll adjust. And watch as we 
rack through the focus there, how we can precisely control where the focus falls in the scene, which I really like. Now, additionally, you have control here by dragging up and down for exposure compensation. And you can see how easy it is to override that. For example, slightly underexposing the scene here. I really like that. Now, these controls are really quite powerful. And when you capture, you have precise control over the file format. If you tap here, you'll see that you can decide to save the different types of files, such as a raw and a processed image, which is quite useful. There we go. Let's go ahead and close that for a second. Also note that as we're working here, we can bring up a loop. That's quite useful for checking focus there for critical detail, which I really like. Now, you can open that up a little further and you'll see that this gives you a few additional modes. That includes the ability to toggle grid, take advantage of very precise self timers, including more than you get in the iPhone by default. So that's quite welcome. And control over white balance. So you can really dial that in precisely for your different lighting conditions. Now, what I like here are the actual settings. This opens up a ton more choices. This is a membership one, so it opens up some extra options. And you can also take precise control over the formats. Notice here, using the ability for Apple Pro Raw or their own native raw format, which is quite valid. So you can go in and really work through. I recommend that you take a look at some of these extra options here, including what sort of information is captured. So pretty quite useful and a pretty awesome app. There's one other app I really like, and it's from the Filmic Pro people. It's called First Light, and it offers great control. Now, a little bit of a simpler interface, but if you tap settings here, you see you can control what you capture, including Pro Raw or their version of a raw file. Very easy timers. And I really like this cool interface. The ability to control the flash, use of overlays to help you with composition, high dynamic range, although that's not going to really make a raw file per se. So generally I'll leave that off. Let's go back to raw. The ability to control the aspect ratio of the camera, which is nice for a little more control and control over the GPS data. If we go into the advanced setting here, you see there's even more, including burst rate and some additional controls here over how the cross swipe behavior works. I like expose and focus. This just lets you draw right on the screen. So notice, very simple to cycle through nailing the exposure and then up and down with that focus peaking to really set focus precisely. Then simply tap and it's capturing those raw files and you can easily switch between the different types of lenses allowing you easy changes there in composition. So those are my two favorites and they work quite well. Now that you understand how to capture raw files on an iPhone, let's go ahead and develop some with Photoshop. It really just starts with Adobe Camera Raw. I'm gonna take a couple of pictures here, this nice series, and you can see that these were shot in the same location at about the same time with the three different lenses on the iPhone. Let's start with this base model. It's always critical 
to choose Adobe Pro Raw. That's going to really get you into the right color space and dynamic range right away. Without, with. What a tremendously huge difference. Then looking at your other adjustments, it's like any other file. I always like to turn on my clipping indicators for my shadows, highlights, and midtones. This really helps me judge if I've got anything clipping. In this case, a hint of black is okay since it's a nighttime photo, but I will get the white point popped a little bit, but try to avoid any true clipping there in the highlights. A little clarity, but be careful not to crush the blacks too much. Now, the other thing to pay attention to is down here under Optics. This is where you want to take advantage of profile corrections. You can see that that definitely compensates for the lens. And in this case, it's finding the correct back lens. So that's working well. That's 9mm, which is going to be effectively the tightest lens on the body of the iPhone. All right. With that done, let's select the other three here. We'll just shift click and I'll right click and choose to synchronize those settings. There we go. And we'll synchronize everything. But after doing so, we need to go under the optics for each and make a small change. So you might find yourself needing to assign the correct optics. There we go. And this will be the iPhone 13 back camera. And that's the ultra wide. And let's use the color mixer tool there with saturation method selected just to desaturate those clouds a little. Mouse over until you see a color selected. And then it's really easy to tone those down. Got this dark clipped area here. I'll go to luminance, mouse over, and brighten just slightly. Then, using the basic area, we can lift up the shadows a little and recover the highlights a bit. A little bit of crushed black there for the pure shadows is okay. Looking at this one, that looks pretty solid. Just come on down to the optics, and I see that it got it correctly. So it's the ultra wide angle that it often struggles with, and you'll have to manually tweak that a bit. That's looking good. I just want to shift the color of the sky here slightly. Let's do the luminance there. Darken the sky a little, and desaturate it a bit. There we go. And now that's a better match between the three as a series. Another thing that will really help the iPhone images come through is the use of texture and clarity. Let's take a look at this one here. Adobe Color really lacks detail there in the highlights, but the Apple Pro Raw is giving us the full dynamic range. What I want to do here is lose this area in the back a bit, though. We'll take advantage of optics first. That's definitely helping, but I want to fix the angle here. So this is a great time to take advantage of the geometry tab. Now you can force the verticals and that helped quite a bit, but I'm going to actually guide these. So by drawing lines on my subject, I can really get this into the right ballpark. There we go. Set my top horizon. And we'll do this window ledge here as well. And that really just gets us to have a perfect grid there in the background. Now, let's bring those highlights down a little bit. But pop the whites. And the use of texture. Quite nice there. And a little bit of clarity brings it through. Now, you might recall that we have new masking tools. This works quite well. I'm going to take advantage here, select this area back here to bring it forward, and then 
subtract from that mask the subject. There we go. Now we have a nice mask for the background. That lets me just darken it down a little bit back there. And we'll come down here to sharpness, negative sharpness, negative texture, and that does a great job of blurring that background. You can see how we just knocked that down. Quite nice. Another thing I like to do with the iPhone is when there's an opportunity, take advantage of panorama. Now, you might be thinking, I thought the panorama was not a raw file. It isn't if you shoot it in camera, but you can make one afterwards by just shooting raw files manually. In fact, no one said panoramas had to be horizontal. Here, I have two raw files, and I simply tilted the camera down to see more of the horizon. Just select both of those images by shift clicking and then right click and choose merge to panorama. The shortcut is command M. That'll invoke photo merge. Now in this case, we're curving and showing inside the sphere. So that's going to be spherical. Cylindrical would be side to side, but spherical really gives us that downward tilt. You can use boundary warp if you want and look at how that actually stretches it a bit more. And in this case, it's compensating nicely. I like that there to get the good vertical lines. And that feels solid. We can use fill edges if we want to fill in the detail on the sides. Give it a second to think. That's okay. I think that's actually filling in most of that detail nicely but we can use that or do the auto crop instead. But that feels pretty good there. Just a little more boundary warp. There we go. And a tiny touch of fill edges, and I can choose merge. It'll take a second, but what it does is asks you where to store the file. I'll just save it in the same location as the originals, and we end up with a new raw file. Now, what we're going to do is a tiny crop, so C for crop, and just move past this baseline here. I'll use a custom crop here, and I'm just cropping past that outcropping of the building. There we go. Quite nice. Now, don't worry too much about the errors there. It's actually got the color profile inside, so you could just apply a new one to the outside of that. That looks quite nice. Let's put a little bit of texture in there for the city and clarity. And then remember, you do have these new masks, so we can do select sky. That's going to target the sky. Then I'm going to subtract a little bit here with a linear gradient. We'll still subtract, but drag upwards. There we go. And that creates a nice transition there on the sky. Nice. And now we can control just the exposure of the sky, as well as the presence of color in the sky. And we'll put a little vignette in on the edges. And let's turn those clipping indicators off. Nice. I like how the sky falls off to a true black, but with a little hint of color there in the horizon. I'd like to revisit the dynamic range for a moment. Let's take a look at a really high contrast shot, shooting right into a light bulb in RAW. Now, in this case, it is essential that you get the right color space. Notice the default rendering that Photoshop is going to do. This really illustrates the need for high dynamic range. But using Apple Pro Raw, it comes through. I'm going to go with a black and white image here. And again, you can see what a difference that makes as you refine those details. 
Let's put a little bit more clarity in. Being careful not to overdo it, but you can really see the artifacts of the glass. And then I will de-check the black and white. This just makes it simple for you to dial in and really get an idea of how the different zones are working. Watch how we can push the glow there for the light and put a little bit of crispness back into the pure blacks. Now, using the color mixer, I'm going to tone down the blacks, desaturating them a bit. You can see the targeted color there. We'll bring that out here in the bulb. That's quite nice. Let's take the yellows up and the oranges down ever so slightly. And that difference there between up for one and down for the other leads to some cross color contrast that really enhances the dynamic range. Now, remember, optics are often missed. And that really did a nice job. Also, when dealing with super high contrast images like we have here, this is a good time for a chromatic aberration. It's faint, but you can see it sometimes along the edge detail. Additionally, speaking of detail, don't be afraid to sharpen. This image is a bit noisy, so you might think sharpening would be out. But all I like to do is hold down the Option or Alt key and first adjust the mask. This helps you control what you're sharpening. Now, you can be a little more aggressive at those edge details. As you hold down the Option or Alt key, you can really see what's happening in the mask. Toning down the detail here, but bumping up the radius, is really helping with that edge. Then, same thing with noise reduction. You can take it up, but hold down the Option or the Alt key, and you can really judge what's happening as you start to add that in. This really helps there maintain key detail in the glass and the filament. And we'll put a little more color noise in. Now, we have a really clean image. If you look at the changes there, in the noise and the edge detail, before and after, taking the time to zoom in and really mask that goes a long, long way. Now, I'm zoomed to 200%. You can do this at 100% or 200% to judge it, but don't do it in a fractional percent. Something solid like that really helps to judge the detail. That really came through nicely. Now, let's talk about perspective. With the iPhone, it's really easy to get low angle shots and experiment. But when you do, you're going to sometimes find distortion. Now, I love to use the geometry options here. And you can try doing a balance method. That's fine. But it's really going to be the upright grid that gives you total control. I've turned the loop option on so I can really see where I'm placing that. And line that up with the edge, like so. And this lets you be super precise with the placements of your guides. There we go. Let's do the same thing here on the edge. Place it. And again, the loop tool helps me judge. And you can see what a huge difference that's already making there. But the loop tool lets you be precise. And I'm going to come to the foreground here, actually, and just use the line of the deck, like so. And you see we've got a much better perspective. Now, optics is still needed even after this type of correction. Remember, the wide angle lens may not be selected correctly. So be careful as you're going through your choices here. 
subtle but works. Then remember, detail is your friend. Hold down the Option key, adjust the mask, then be a little bit more aggressive to sharpen. The smaller sensor of the iPhone will really benefit from this. Bring out the texture, a little bit of clarity, and then use your gradients. Let's do a linear gradient from foreground to midground. And we'll put a little shadow into the foreground there just to create fall off. Now that worked nicely. Let's create a new mask and select the sky. And for this one, we can just bring out the color a little more for a nice blue sky. Recover the highlights, but push the white point. Remember, don't be afraid to look at that histogram and clipping indicators. This will help you really judge what's happening. And we can then use the highlight recovery there and the white point to bring out those clouds. Very nice. Once that's done, a little color grading with the color mixer never hurts. Just go back to your standard adjustment, grab your on image tool, and you can refine things like such. There we go. Good. Darken down the wood ever so slightly. Nice. And that really brings it to life. And put a little gentle vignette there at the edges. The key with the camera is to not be afraid to push it. Putting it into tiny places and letting it really go to work. That dynamic range of the Apple Pro RAW file is amazingly versatile. Look at how it captured all the detail there and can handle the backlit sky and the tight subject of shadows. You're then free to push it with a little texture and clarity. Remember, split your dynamic range. Shadows up, black point back down. Highlights down, white point up. And that really just helps you understand what's happening there. And you can turn on those clipping indicators to see if anything is going too far. Nice. We'll just take the global exposure down slightly and a little more lift to the shadows there. We've got it. Now, as we push this, it's always important to remember the smaller sensor. Punch into 100 or 200%. Look at your magnification level there. Let's go to 100. And use your details panel first with masking. And then bring out the sharpening and details. There we go. Go not too aggressive. That helps. Then your color grading tool with the color mixer lets you target individual areas. For example, let's darken those greens a little bit and bring out the saturation in the blues for the sky. And we've got a nice combination there. Now, you can see that it's quite possible to bring images to life with the iPhone sensor. There's a lot there, but if you need to, remember there is a little trick. You could take any image that's a RAW file and tell it that you would like to enhance. This brings up the ability to use super resolution, which will double the pixel count of the image. 
When you do this, it makes a new raw file that's twice the size. You can see here that this one's at 35% magnification, and this one's at 17, half, because it's literally double the resolution. Feel free to still take advantage of the Pro Raw dynamic range, and then really get your recovery right. There we go. A little clarity and texture. Nice. And then use your color mixer the rest of the way. By mixing the luminance here, we can darken this area of the chest and bring out its saturation for rich colors. Can tone down the color here on the feathers. Darken the boards. Now, this is literally a photo shot from a great distance through a barrier at the zoo, but it still turned out pretty well. Handheld shot, but we can quickly fix the common errors, like so, and still produce a usable photo. All right, there's one more thing I want to show you that's actually not raw. Let's go ahead and click Done to store these files. I can open them up later. But I want to show you something that you might miss, and that is the ability to access the depth mat. To do this, you will have shot in portrait mode. The next technique I'm going to show you requires you to use Adobe Bridge. Just choose File, Browse and Bridge from within Photoshop, and then navigate to images that you shot using portrait mode. Here's a couple. Right click and open in Camera Raw. Portrait mode images have an embedded depth mat. Let's take a look at this one here. It's going to be really quite clear. First up, you can open up the photo. You won't see that Pro Raw because the profile is baked in. But if you go to the masks here, you'll see an option called depth range. This lets you show the depth map and start to adjust. This is actually using the LiDAR sensor in your camera there to define what's close and what's far. Now, what we can do is darken that area behind the flower. Let's turn off the depth map from being visible, but it's still being used. And notice there how we can just selectively darken down behind our subject a bit and tone down the colors a little. So it pulls the focus. A little negative texture to defocus back there. And in fact, a little negative clarity too. And a little negative sharpness. And you see that we actually have a nice defocus effect. That works well. Now I'll go back to the global tool. Improve the global clarity and texture. That helps create some nice sharpness there in the foreground. And a gentle vignette. If we look at the before and after, let's put those side by side. You can see the transformation of the depth map to really de-emphasize the background. Here that technique is again. Click on mask and use the depth range, make it visible, and start to refine. You can literally see the depth there and the glass registers as being on that plane with a nice transition there to the edge of the table. Now, you are free to refine the other areas. I often like to tweak these and still get good dynamic range. For the background area, I tend to desaturate a little bit and then pull down sharpness with detail and texture. And that creates a little bit of a defocus effect back there. Then go up to the global view 
and definitely push the whole image back. Now we can bring out things like global texture and clarity. And look at the wood texture there in the foreground, as well as the glass come to life. And with our color mixer, we can target select areas like those umbrellas there the saturation of the beer and make that just a little brighter so it cuts through. That depth map is a very powerful tool and it's built into the portrait mode images. You can access it using Adobe Camera Raw, but it's very hidden. You have to open the image through bridge and then access the depth map inside the masking tool. Okay. I hope you got a lot of ideas on how to put all these pieces together and that you see that using Photoshop and Adobe Camera Raw is a great way to properly develop these files. Now, you can of course open the images up when you're done in Camera Raw and take advantage of any other Photoshop tools, but I love these precise controls. I find that Raw on the iPhone is more than capable getting great details, showing texture, depth, capturing the moment, but still having control, being able to go in close on the subject, showing the landscape, or just moments of life. And with the control over the dynamic range, you can really shoot things that have contrast. It's surprising how much this sensor can take. I find that while I still love using my more professional cameras, I can get a lot done with this camera and it's nice and small so it's easy to keep with me at pretty much all times. If you want to get in touch, feel free to reach out, I'd be glad to hear from you. You can find me on social media. Definitely feel free to connect. And if you're looking to learn more about photography, go ahead and check out my website at photofocus.com. I hope you've enjoyed learning how to get the most from an iPhone with Apple Pro Raw and Adobe Photoshop. My name's Rich Harrington, and you are enjoying the Photoshop Virtual Summit. Please feel free to check out the bundle so you can get all these great recordings and be able to watch these classes again. I really think you're gonna enjoy all the instructors. There's a tremendous team here. And I hope you learn how to take your Photoshop skills up to a higher skill level.